Welcome, everyone. For the next hour or so, we're going to be discussing imaging of the small bowel and colon. Some basic principles we're going to be following here is we're going to look at the wall of the bowel, decide if it's too thick or too thin, possibly, versus normal. We're going to look at the enhancement or attenuation or signal intensity of that bowel wall. In addition to looking at the wall itself, we're also going to look at the distribution of any abnormalities that we see within the bowel. Does it involve a specific portion of the bowel, like all the colon or all the small bowel, or is it more focal or even segmental in its involvement? And we're also going to use the advantages that we get from CT and MR imaging, right, where we can see not just what's going on in the bowel lumen, but also what may be going on outside of the bowel to clue us in on the etiology of what may be happening. So before we get too deep into the weeds, remember, we always need to take a step back and decide what is normal. And here you'll see a um, small bowel follow through fluoroscopic examination of the bowel, CT coronal view and an MR two weighted coronal view of the bowel. And I like to use this image as well to emphasize the um, value that you get from doing coronal imaging of the bowel when you're trying to evaluate it because you get a look at the much more bowel at any given moment um, on a single image here that will allow you to be a little bit more sensitive to detecting abnormalities in both bowel caliber as well as wall thickness and even enhancement. You'll notice that we see the same pattern on any imaging modality that we're using to evaluate the bowel, such that we see an abundance of folds um, within the jejunum, which is predominantly located in the left upper quadrant of the abdomen, and a fewer number of folds within the ilium, um, as you can see here, which is predominantly located in the lower abdomen pelvis, um, as well as sometimes more so in the right lower quadrant. Doesn't matter what imaging modality you use, this is the same pattern of fold um, spacing that you should expect to see in the jejunum and ilium. And remember that abnormalities of the folds themselves can be a clues as to some sort of diffuse abnormalities uh, in the bowel, such as malabsorptive disorders like celiac. So let's look at the bowel wall thickness. Remember the bowel wall thickening with or without preservation of folds can be due to any number of causes. You might be worried about malignancy. Um, there might be tissue that is occupying that space, or it could be edema from any number of causes. Um, hemorrhage can also cause the appearance of bowel wall thickening. Regardless of the etiology of the bowel wall thickening, you need to see if the underlying architecture of the bowel has been preserved. Mural stratification indicates to you that we still have those concentric layers in the bowel that we would normally expect in normal bowel. They'll just be a little bit more conspicuous to us sometimes in, under different types of pathology. Most of our causes of um, edema of the bowel end up re resulting in edema of the submucosa with widening of that portion of the bowel and increased conspicuity of the enhancement of the mucosa or the inner layer of the bowel, as well as the serosal layer or muscularis propria of the bowel. So you can Use the terminology of mural stratification, whether you see two layers or even all three layers of the bowel. But what's important, once again, is that the preservation of those normal layers tells you that we still have normal underlying architecture of that bowel, which is something that does not preserved in the cases of malignancy. Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and let's take a look at CT in the year 2025. You've heard a... Uh, really impressive amount of talks and information the last two days. So let's really look at where we think things are going. Now, I will tell you that I've given similar talks in the past, but one would have to admit you realize that trying to predict things is not easy. Just think COVID-19. On 1231, 2019, there was zero articles published. No one heard of it. And when I looked yesterday, there was 56,963 articles in PubMed. Think about how many articles, particularly all those computer articles that are not in PubMed. So predicting is very dangerous. Those who know, uh, who have knowledge, don't predict. Those who predict don't have knowledge. A very old and wise quote. People who were smart often were not good at predicting. Charles Dell, head of the patent office, over 100 years ago, felt that everything that can be invented had been invented. Tom Watson, the founder of IBM, thought there was maybe a market for five computers. I think I have five of them on my desktop now. Or even Bill Gates, 640K ought to be enough for anybody. That doesn't even cover your watch, of course. 
But maybe a better quote by Bill Gates, we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. Don't let yourself be lulled into inaction. And that's maybe a better point. I think things come along that are really hot, but many things will take a while to develop. And I'm going to cover some of those today. I always love this Don Rumsfeld quote. As we know, there are the known knowns. There are the things we know we know. We also know there are the known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns, the ones we don't know we don't know. So I'm going to try to cover a little bit of the latter and a bunch of the middle thing. Now, when you look at healthcare, everybody is interested in healthcare. Forbes magazine talks about predicting growth in the healthcare industry. The costs go up. How the money is spent will vary depending on the articles you read. And the growth, as you can look at this chart, is showing that Asia is going to be the biggest growth. Growth in healthcare and healthcare costs always relates to changes in the middle class and a growing population. Now, this article also mentioned about two dozen key technologies being developed. And if you look at radiology, we're pretty good, whether it's brain-computer interfaces or precision medicine, 3D printing, digital avatars, AI, are all things we're involved with. And as we spread out and do more, we're involved in other things. This morning, we're going to change directions to coronary CTA, uh, talk about uh, how to utilize coronary CTA in 2022 and uh, integration into the ER. So without further ado, uh, we'll talk about uh, modern scanner protocols, coronary CTA acquisition, uh, utilizing coronary CTA in the emergency department, and then we'll change uh, gears and talk about beyond anatomical imaging with CTFFR and CT perfusion, and then we'll round it out with uh, ablation imaging and cardioversion imaging, which can also be performed in the emergency department. So I want to go back and just review a little bit of the literature about coronary CTA. It's, it's quite robust. Um, it's been, we've been doing coronary CTA since the 90s um, on early generations uh, scanners. The early studies were all performed on 64 slice scanners in the early 2000s. Uh, we've come a long way since then with our 256, 320 slice scanners with um, 16 centimeter detectors. Um, are also dual source scanners like Siemens Force with rapid temporal resolution. And what that affords us is really decreased contrast dosing, less radiation, and then um, uh, improved accuracy as well. So we've got excellent spatial resolution and it's a very fast non-invasive test. So when we look at some of the landmark trials, um, Accuracy Core 64 were, were really two of the main ones that got us starting to think that, wow, coronary CTA really is the best way to, to look at patients with chest pain and evaluate for obstructive coronary disease. Um, these studies compared the sensitivity, specificity, and diagnostic accuracy, and they were all performed on older generation scanners. And they looked at degree of stenosis um, in, a, in a decent number of patients total, and they found there was a high high sensitivity and high negative predictive value. And so we look, here's just an example of the accuracy study, um, which, which came out in the early 2000s, um, just demonstrating uh, high sensitivity uh, with coronary CTA. And CORE64 looked at comparing coronary CTA to invasive angiography, um, and they found that um, quite comparable. So there's really extensive literature supporting coronary CTA as the first line therapy, but the question is, can we do it out in the emergency department? Um, is it cost effective? Does it, how is it related to ER throughput? When you look at um, cost in the emergency department and ER throughput, is it cost effective? And then is it worthwhile? Is there a survival benefit related to earlier diagnosis of obstructive disease and utility of medical therapy. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit, especially with um, ischemia trial coming out and, and some of the um, additional um, trials that have been published in the last couple years, really demonstrating that medical management is, is just as good as some of our invasive therapies. And then also comparing the radiation dose uh, to nuclear stress testing. A lot of times we don't think about the radiation that's associated with myocardial perfusion image. 